Hey guys, this is chapter 11, part two of your essentials of radiographic physics and imaging. And this actually picks up on page 143. Um, and we will begin talking about grids. This chapter is all about image production um, and evaluation and uh, evaluating the exposure technique. And we started with talking about um, selections that we make on the control panel, like our KVP and our mass, and how those actually affect um, the image that we create, and how um, with digital, that mass and KVP don't have as significant an effect on exposure as they did um, with film, but that they still play a part in that. Uh, that's where we began talking, uh, and then we kind of moved on to some of the secondary factors, and we spoke about focal spot size, um, our uh, SID, our source to image receptor distance, our OID, the object to image receptor distance, and then we talked about magnification, which is size distortion. Um, we talked about central ray alignment when we last left off, and this picks up with continuing on with secondary factors and we start off with grids on page 143. So the purpose of the grid is basically to improve the contrast on an image and a grid is placed between the patient and the image receptor and the whole point of a grid is for it to absorb the Compton scatter radiation that gets created in the patient so that it does not strike our image receptor. So it's placed between the patient and the IR, and in theory, it would absorb the scatter radiation, the Compton scatter radiation that's created in the patient as it exits before it interacts with the image receptor. And if we can limit the amount of scatter reaching the IR, it raises or improves the radiographic quality, and it also raises the contrast because it eliminates some of those unwanted shades of gray that we would get on our image that would do nothing to benefit us or the image. It would simply take away from the image. So if we can place the grid in the path of those photons, in theory, those photons would be absorbed by the lead lines in the grid and then it would improve our overall image. And you can see in this picture here that they have the primary beam coming through the patient. You can see some of the scatter that's being created because there's a loss in energy and a change in direction. And when that happens, ideally these photons would not strike the IR, but they have the potential to strike anyone in the room. The scatter that continues on directed towards the image receptor, you can see that the image receptor is down here, and then we have the grid placed in between the patient and the IR. And you can see that it is capturing multiple of the Compton scatter photons that are created. So some still might strike, but not near as many as if we did not utilize a grid. So a grid improves the quality of the image and raises the contrast because it pulls out some of those unwanted shades of gray. Right. We had spoke before about um, a grid and the fact that just by using a grid, it necessitates a rise in mass because we have to compensate for the loss in quantity because the grid doesn't know the difference between a transmitted photon or a Compton scattered photon. So in order to compensate for the loss in quantity, you raise your mass value by a certain grid conversion factor. And there's actually a formula to calculate that. I know that looks a little blurry. I'm not really sure why. But the formula that I had given you guys, it kind of eliminates one of the steps. It's a little bit different than the formula they give you in the book because I eliminate one step. You pretty much take the grid conversion factor of the second set of um, se second circumstance that they give you and you divide it by the grid conversion factor of the first instance that they give you, and you multiply that answer times the mass, and it would give you the new mass that you would have to use. For example, um, if let's say that you had um, a patient that you did their abdomen, and you used 80 kVp at 10 mass, 
and you did that on a um, 12 to 1 grid ratio, okay, which has a grid conversion factor of 5. All right, and then let's say that that same patient required um, an image to be done in ICU, but you didn't have for the portable, you didn't have a 12 to 1 grid, you only had a 6 to 1 grid. And they want to know what would you use when you do the portable with a 6 to 1 grid. So the 6 to 1 grid conversion factor is a 3. So you take the second grid conversion factor, which was the 6 to 1, so you put 3 because 6 to 1 is 3. So you would literally put, based on the problem I just gave you, you would put 3, the second grid conversion factor on top, over the original one I said was 12 to 1, which is a 5. So you put 3 over 5, and then multiply that times your mass, which I said was 10. Okay, And if you take 3 and you divide it by 5, Three divided by five, you end up with 0.6 and multiply that by 10 and you would get six mass would be what you would use on a six to one grid ratio up in ICU compared to the 10 mass you would use on a 12 to one grid ratio. Right? So you just eliminate one step according to what the book tells you to do. My my formula eliminates one step. So it's literally you divide out the fraction, multiply that by your original mass, and that'll give you the second mass factor that you would have to use for that particular problem. Okay, so now that we've looked at that, we will practice some of these and we will actually do some of these grid conversions to make sure that you guys understand um, how to work those and how exactly you would calculate what mass you would need. All right. Now, when we look at grids as well, there's an image on the bottom of 144, and it shows you how using a grid affects your image quality. Okay. So you've got three pictures of a right knee, picture A, B, and C, and they reference that with picture A, that is a quality image created without a grid. So this was likely done tabletop. Okay, you can see you have sufficient brightness. Yeah, in my opinion, you have really low contrast because it's kind of all grayed out. Okay, typically a um, typically the knee is thicker than 10 centimeters, and you use more than 60 kVp on the knee. And the two factors that are required typically to use a grid, you utilize a grid when the part exceeds 10 centimeters in thickness, which is approximately four inches, or when your KVP is above 60. And typically for a knee, especially an adult knee, you would utilize a grid. So this first picture, they have taken a quality image, they say, without a grid. But to me, it's very low contrast. In picture B, they used a grid, but they did not adjust their mass value. So it does have higher contrast, meaning it's more black and white compared to picture A. But if you see in the book, there's actually quantum noise in this image because you didn't have enough photons present to create this image because you didn't alter your mass value, and now they were utilizing a grid. And then picture C, they took and made that image with the grid, but they made the appropriate mass adjustment. And now with this last picture, it does have higher contrast than picture A, and there is less quantum noise visible, which means that this is the most appropriate image to be done on this adult knee because you don't have quantum noise, so you have a sufficient amount of mass used to image the patient. And you also have the proper um, contrast scale where it's not just completely all grayed out. You can actually make out trabecular patterns in the bone and um, you can see the anatomy a little bit better, better visualization for the radiologist to make a diagnosis. Then they go into another 
uh, secondary factor, which is beam restriction. And beam restriction actually starts on page 144. And beam restriction is when there's any change in the size of the x-ray field that alters the amount of tissue that gets radiated. So beam restriction can be used interchangeably with collimation. Okay, when you restrict the beam, you basically limit where the beam can go. How do we do that? Typically, when we utilize the tube and we hit the light or we hit the button so that the light comes on, that light coming from the collimator is indicative everywhere light touches, radiation will touch. And where light does not illuminate, no radiation will touch, in theory. That is how it takes place. So when you change the size of the x-ray field, you alter how much tissue actually gets radiated. And if you have a larger field size, then it increases the amount of tissue radiated, causing more scatter to be produced. More Compton scatter will be produced because you're working in a larger area. That'll increase the amount of radiation that reaches the IR, which can result in lower or less graphic contrast, meaning this is where we tend to see it uh, more grayed out, okay? So the contrast is very low. When you use a smaller field size, it'll reduce how much tissue gets radiated and it'll reduce the amount of scatter that actually is produced in the patient so by, by doing that, it'll reduce the amount of radiation that reaches the image receptor, and that'll give you higher radiographic contrast. Now, when I said beam restriction, and I said that also can be used with collimation, realize that collimation, by definition, means making a smaller field size. So when you increase collimation, it means that the field size is getting smaller. And when you decrease collimation, it means that your field size is getting bigger. Okay, now how do we determine if we use a large versus a small field size? You basically want to keep the area that is radiated to a minimum. So you need to know where, what anatomy we're imaging and where the area of interest is and we limit the x-ray field size to just beyond the area of interest, okay? And by collimating, this is an appropriate method to protect the patient from overexposure to unnecessary radiation. So we always want to limit the field size to just beyond the area of interest, enough so much that you could fit your marker in the light field um, you don't want to clip any pertinent anatomy, but at the same time, you don't want to um, over-radiate the patient and, and cause unnecessary radiation for the patient. So, again, kind of confusing. Beam restriction and collimation are used interchangeably. When you restrict the beam, you limit where it can go, and when you collimate, just by using that term, collimation, implies that you're making the field size smaller. So when you increase collimation, you're making the field size smaller. And when you decrease collimation, you're actually making the field size bigger. And this is accomplished with the two little knobs on the front of the tube head that we can turn and get various sizes and shapes of the x-ray field, typically we're either going to get a square or a rectangle, but the number of field sizes is pretty much limitless. Um, so you can always collimate to just beyond the area of interest. Another factor that they list as a secondary factor would be the generator output. Okay, the generator output, it is um, important to know what type of generator your x-ray imaging system is operating on. The different types of generators, there are single phase generators, which are very inefficient, and most of our facilities do not have single phase equipment. And then there's what they call three phase six pulse, 
three phase 12 pulse and high frequency generators. All right, so in order from least efficient to most efficient, the least efficient would be the single phase generator and the most efficient would be the high frequency generator. Now, what do I mean by um, efficient? The higher the efficiency, it requires less exposure settings in order to produce an image. So the high frequency generator does not need near as much on the settings to produce a large amount of radiation. So it's actually better for the patient because you're able to set lower technique and still accomplish what you need to. The single phase, um, very inefficient. The other thing that comes along with um, the generators is price. So single phase is much less expensive than a high frequency generator. And realistically, three phase six pulse or three phase 12 pulse generators work perfectly fine. Most of the facilities um, that we use have either three phase or high frequency generators. Very, very rarely will you find anywhere operating on a single phase unit unless it's um, maybe an old time doctor's office or a dental office um, where the doctor is you know, just about to retire and doesn't want to spend a fortune on equipment because he's only got one year left in practice. That's typically where you would find that. Probably also find that in veterinary offices. All right, so generators that have more efficient output require lower exposure technique settings in order to produce an image, which is better for your patient. And recognize too that generators have to be calibrated periodically to make sure that they are producing consistent radiation output, meaning they have to be tested um, periodically to make sure that they are performing how they are supposed to. All right, now we're gonna look at tube filtration. And we've talked about filtration before and the fact that the main purpose of filtration is to lower patient dose. All right. Um, the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurement tells us that x-ray tubes that operate above 70 kVp have to have a minimum of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalency of filtration, all right? And that is set by the Environmental Protection Agency of the federal government. And the thing that determines how much filtration we need is based on our operating KVP. So if we happen to be a small orthopedic clinic that specializes maybe in hands and wrists, we're not gonna need as much filtration as this um, general purpose tube. All right, so it's based on your operating KVP and realize that when you filter something, you are getting less as far as the quantity of that particular thing, but it's got higher quality. So like water, if you put a Brita filter on your kitchen sink and filter the water so that you get rid of all the impurities and the nasty stuff, the sediment that's in our water, you would be left with less water because you're pulling some of that stuff out, but the water that you had would be of much higher quality than the water that wasn't filtered, okay? So when we look at this emission spectrum, notice that when we have four millimeters of filtration versus two, there is a lot less quantity, meaning where they interact with the y-axis is lower, but at the same time, the peak, which represents the average energy, when you have more filtration, notice that the peak is further to the right with four millimeters of filtration versus two millimeters of filtration, okay? So there's a shift in quality, meaning it's higher quality, but there's also less of it, right? But, but that's okay because again, filtration is good for your patient. Compensating filters are another thing that we can utilize. Um, remember that compensating filters are used for unequal subject density or unequal part thickness. 
So they tell you that when you image an area that varies greatly in its tissue thickness, kind of like the foot, because the toes are very thin, but back by the ankle and the forefoot, it's very thick. So when you're imaging an area that varies in its tissue thickness, you could use a compensating filter in the path of the primary beam in order to give you a more uniform exposure to the IR. So typically when we used to do feet, the toes would get burned out in order to properly penetrate back in the, the midfoot in the heel section. Okay, so if you used a wedge filter and you put um, the, the thick part of the wedge over the toes and the thin part of the wedge over the ankle, that would give you much more uniform penetration of the part so that everything came out looking more uniformly penetrated instead of black toes and a, a white, you know, forefoot. When we use any kind of compensating filter, realize that you're filtering some of the quantity. And any time we're, we're losing quantity, we have to compensate by altering our technical factors. But they do go on to say that typically now, because of the digital images and the capability of altering the brightness levels and the contrast after you've seen the image, that typically compensating filters are not used routinely in our field anymore. All right, then they start to talk about some patient factors, okay? Factors that are significant um, to the patient that can affect how our image comes out. So when they talk about body habitus, by their definition, it says it's the general form or build of the body, including its size. And it tells us that we have to know the, about the body habitus when we're trying to establish exposure techniques. So there are actually four types of body habituses. There is the stenic body habitus, asthenic, hypostenic, and hypersthenic. So this one right here, stenic, basically means average or normal, okay? Now, I my definition of body habit is pretty much the framework of the patient where all the internal organs lie. So if you were going to um, pour yourself a driveway, you would have to frame up the driveway with two by fours and place them so that when you poured the concrete, all the concrete would fill in between the two by fours that you set up and that would be your framework. So the body has a framework as well and all the internal organs lie within that framework. So this represents the normal or average person. So average size and height, average width, not overweight, not underweight, just you know, with, in relation to um, height and width, relatively normal. Below the stenic patient, you have what's called hyposthenic. And these people, notice that they're a little bit thicker from side to side, but probably still um, having some amount of height, just a little bit thicker throughout the midsection. Okay, and that's hyposthenic, just below stenic. And then asthenic, these patients are very narrow from side to side, and they tend to be very long-waisted. If you look at the stomach of this person, notice that this is their pelvis right here, and all of their abdominal organs have dropped because they're very narrow from side to side. So these types of patients, you know, we all have the same parts. We all have, you know, X amount of feet of small and large intestine. Um, we all have a liver, pancreas, some of us have a gallbladder, um, kidneys, ureters, all of that stuff has to fit in there. It's just that some people, their framework is tall and slender. Some people's framework, you're shorter and wider, but we all have the same stuff that fits in there. The last body habit is hypersthenic. Actually, you know what? These are flipped. 
because this is hyposthenic and this is hypersthenic. So that is not correct. I will um, switch this before you guys watch this, but just recognize that this is not hypersthenic and this is not hypothenic. This, this is hypersthenic and this is hyposthenic. Okay. Um, so I will fix that before you guys see it. When you are looking at, um, actually, when you're looking at your PowerPoint, I will fix it before I post it, but I don't believe that it will change in this recording. So on the left-hand side, the top picture is hyposthenic, and the bottom picture is hypersthenic. Okay, now hypersthenic, they're a lot um, wider from side to side, and they're not very tall. So what, why do we care about all this? First, let me tell you that it's very subjective, meaning if you think someone is hypersthenic, I might think uh, relatively sthenic, maybe on the bigger side of sthenic. So in order from widest frame to narrowest, it would be hypersthenic, sthenic, hyposthenic, asthenic. From narrowest to widest, going the opposite way, it would be asthenic, hyposthenic, sthenic, hypersthenic. Now, what kind of things change? Well, notice the lungs change on these patients. Like on a sthenic patient, they're pretty, you know, top to bottom, side to side. They look relatively normal. Nothing crazy about that patient's lungs not fitting on the IR. Notice as they get taller and narrower, though, their lungs get longer. And then when the patient is wider, then the lungs tend to be short and kind of squatty. So they're, they're shorter and broader on this patient versus sthenic patient. Other things to note is notice how the internal organs tend to spread out to the periphery of the abdomen. Okay, they tend to spread from side to side because it has more room. Um, if you're wider, then it's gonna go more side to side. If you're very tall and narrow, then realize things are going to drop um, into, you know, a lot of times the pelvis, like this asthenic patient. Notice how their intestines, um, their stomach has got a significant J-hook to it, but it's also down in the pelvic region just because this person is so narrow from side to side. So what you think is sthenic and or hypersthenic or hypo, I might say, no, I don't think so. So it's very subjective. But the thing I don't want you to get hooked up on is don't think that asthenic people are skinny and hypersthenic people are fat. That is not what I'm saying. If someone is hypersthenic, it just tends to mean the wider and shorter. So don't equate hypersthenic with fat and asthenic with skinny. Just because someone is wider from side to side, they could be very tall, and that might be relatively sthenic for them. It's not we have to label any of this on our requisition or anything. It's just understanding where the anatomy will lie and making sure that we're not clipping anything. Because on a hypersthenic patient with shorter lungs that tend to go more side to side, you have to be careful not to clip the cost of phrenic angles. Same thing with an asthenic patient. Their lungs are very long. So you have to make sure that you attempt to get the top of the lungs in there as well as the bottom of the lungs. Now that's actually a pretty decent image. It is possible that they might have to take two, but I'm just letting you know that body habitus is a very subjective um, concept because your definition of normal and my definition of normal might be slightly off. What's another patient factor that affects the image would be the part thickness. Okay, so the thickness of the part that's being imaged absolutely affects the amount of x-ray beam attenuation that takes place. Typically a thicker part will absorb more radiation and a thinner part will transmit more radiation.
not saying that, um, you know, I mean, the thickness of the part, you know, if you're, if you're imaging the abdomen and the person is solid muscle, then that's probably going to be a little bit thicker and attenuate the beam differently than if you have someone who is, you know, 15 years old and basically a couch potato, um, How can I say that? Well, maybe I say that. When we talked about part thickness before, remember we said um, part thickness is is a factor, but you know we could be talking about um, angel food cake that we said is not very dense versus cheesecake was really dense. The thicknesses were different, but it different, but it also plays a part with regard to the mass density of what you're going through. <clears throat> so if you have a thicker part, it tends to absorb more radiation. A thinner part will transmit more radiation. But whether the part is increased or decreased in thickness, the change in mass has to accompany that in order to maintain exposure to your image receptor. So sometimes we make the part thinner by placing the patient um, in a certain position. Like if if we're doing something in the abdomen and we need the part to be as thin as it can, sometimes we'll place the patient PA so that we can use their own body weight to compress them and make them thinner. All right, so sometimes your positioning, you can help alter um, the part thickness and overcome some of that part thickness by the way that you place the patient, but overall, Thicker body part tends to absorb more radiation. Thinner part will allow more transmission to take place. With regard to part thickness, they show you some images on page 148. All right, so this picture A, they tell you is a quality image. Again, this is a right hip. Picture B, so this is a diagnostic image. Picture B, they have, um, this image was created with thickness and no mass adjustment. So they made the part thicker. This is phantom parts. They made the part thicker, but they didn't compensate with a mass adjustment. So there's increased quantum noise in this image. Again, easier to visualize in the book where the pictures are a little bit bigger. Um, and there's a little bit more clarity in the book versus the PowerPoint slide. Picture C was created with added patient thickness, but they compensated with the mass adjustment. So there was decreased quantum noise and a more diagnostic image. Okay, so this one is thicker with the appropriate mass adjustment. This one is thicker without the mass adjustment. And this one is just not added thickness, but just a diagnostic image. And these two are definitely more alike than these two. So anytime there's a change in part thickness, we should compensate with a change in mass. They also talk about the subject contrast. Okay, and the subject contrast, basically what they tell you is that the structure that you're imaging can affect the contrast that plays out on your image. All right, so um, when the structure has a wide range of tissue composition, you tend to have high subject contrast. And anatomic structures that have similar types of tissues will demonstrate low subject contrast. So we can't do anything about the composition of the part that we're imaging, but by altering the KVP, it'll all the absorption and the transmission that takes place, and that does affect our contrast. Okay, so knowing about the different absorption characteristics of the tissues and how KVP will affect that helps us produce a desired level of radiographic contrast. And remember, contrast is subjective, and it's pretty much up to, um, they told us it's up to the um, do they call it the diagnostician? I can't remember the term that they used, but basically they, 
they left it to where um, it sounded like it was up to us, but realistically it's up to the radiologist since he or she has to read the image. Okay, so they show you that with this, um, when you have higher contrast, that's where you tend to have white, gray, and black. And when you have more contrast, you tend to have more just um, more equivalent shades of gray throughout your entire image. Like an abdomen is a good example of a lower contrast body part, whereas an extremity, like a hand, tends to exhibit high contrast. And usually with um, with an extremity, you're using lower KVP, so you have more absorption taking place and transmission. And then like in the abdomen, you use higher KVP, but the parts are all the basically the same composition. So everything tends to look like different shades of gray. It's much lower subject contrast, meaning everything is just different shades of gray. Like these three shades of gray are very similar, um, but the differences are there. They're just very subtle, whereas these differences are very distinct. Right? So when you alter the KVP, it obviously alters whether the photon is going to be absorbed or transmitted. The last part of this chapter, they go into radiation protection and they review a few things with us. With regard to KVP and mass, they tell us that whenever it's possible, you should use high KVP, low mass techniques because that will reduce patient exposure. All right, so when you raise your KVP and you reduce your mass value, then typically that will give you um, a decent radiographic image, but at the same time, it'll lower your dose from the, um, to the patient. So we typically, I can tell you that with film techniques, when they went to CR imaging, what they did was they took film, the technique for film, they raised the KVP 15%, and they cut the mass value in half when we went to CR imaging. When we went to digital imaging, like direct radiography, then they tended to raise the KVP as well and cut the mass value in half. So now we're using much more penetrating radiation. We have the capability of the digital uh, systems to correct or alter certain factors that we used to never be able to control, which gives us overall better image quality and reduces patient dose. So it's a win-win situation. As far as beam restriction, whenever we perform an exam, we always want to limit the radiation field to the area of interest, just beyond the area of interest so that we can fit our marker in there. Um, and so as not to clip any anatomy. So collimation is a basic way to protect the patient from any unnecessary radiation exposure. As for grid selection, they tell you that um, when you have to decide about using a grid or not, that using a grid and then choosing the grid ratio, you wanna balance the image quality along with the patient protection because remember the higher the grid ratio, the more of an increase you need in mass. So in order to keep the patient's exposure as low as possible and adhere to that Alara principle, you really should only use grids when it's appropriate. And the grid ratio should be the lowest that will give sufficient contrast improvement. Okay. Um, and now they also have, which this is not in your book, but I had you guys that there's actually virtual grid software which is a program that's designed to remove the low exposure pixels from the histogram analysis. And we haven't really talked about that yet, but we will. So it's a software program where you can take an image without using a grid, without raising your technique, and you can have this program where the computer automatically removes those low exposure pixels that probably came from Compton scattered photons. It removes it from the histogram analysis, which means it basically removes it from your image. So it's like you used a grid, but you didn't have to raise the technical values and you didn't have to go through the hassle of using the grid. The software just acts like a grid in that it pulls out those low energy photons.
okay so it takes it removes it from your image receptor but it doesn't do anything for your patient but realize you're also not having to raise your your mass value to compensate for utilizing a grid so that software is really awesome um, it seems to be catching on more and more which is a good thing all right and the last part they talk about excessive radiation exposure and digital imaging even though the computer can adjust the image brightness and the contrast they tell you that if, if a tech routinely uses more radiation than is required for the procedure then you are absolutely unnecessarily increasing your patient dose so even though the system can compensate for the overexposure it does not compensate for the exposure to the patient it only compensates by correcting what your image looks like so it's unethical to knowingly overexpose a patient it is uh, an ethical violation you could absolutely be brought up um, on ethical charges for that because you're you're violating the trust of the public by knowing and purposely um, using technical values that you know to be inappropriate all right the last um, few images on here come from page 150 and 151 and i've shown you these before these are pretty much just nice concise charts that tell us about the exposure factors and how they affect the primary beam and the remnant beam or the exit beam that reaches the ir um, if it were me honestly i would probably uh, copy these or make sure I had a picture of these and be able to try and go through each one and discuss why it affects the primary beam that way and why does it affect um, the exit beam that reaches the IR. All right, so table 11 2 are the exposure factors and how they affect the primary beam and the exit beam. 11.3 is just a continuation onto the next page, but that is the technique factors and how they affect the image quality. And it says that those individual factors change without exposure compensation. So when they mass, actually that's on the next slide, I'm sorry. When they look at mass and they tell you if you increase your mass, then it increases let the slide catch up. Okay, it's kind of hard to see, but um, what they're telling you, like, if you increase your mass, it increases the IR exposure. It has really no effect on the brightness because of that point processing function of the automatic rescaling. It does not mess, never affects your contrast. It has no effect on your spatial resolution and no effect on your distortion. Same with KVP. If we increase the KVP, it increases the IR exposure. It has no effect on your brightness. It definitely does affect your contrast because if your KVP goes up, then your contrast goes down. And it has no effect on your spatial resolution and your distortion. So these are just really good ways to make sure that you understand the concepts that are actually being taught in these chapters. That takes us to the end of chapter 11. Um, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, I hope that you were writing those down so that we can discuss them and hopefully clear up anything that, that is confusing. With that, I hope you have a good day and thank you so much.